we're not just in the field of weight loss, but in the field of addiction recovery. Mm -hmm. So understanding that, that it's about breaking the ties with the foods that we say we love that just aren't loving us back. Hey friends, welcome to The Empire Show. My name is Bedros Koulian and this is an inside look. And today we've got someone very special, uh, someone who is not only a coaching client of mine, but also uh, a, a friend because I get to work with her and growing her business. And then we get to share with you how her brick and mortar businesses are growing, the strategies that she's using, and then how we are pivoting her business model to the online world to be able to help more people. So. Without any further ado, I would like to welcome Dr. Ashley Lucas to the show. Thanks, Pedros, for having me. Thank you for being here, mm -hmm. Ashley. And um, before we get started on this, um, I guess we ought to tell folks, kind of uh, tell us what you do, what the core of your business is, mm -hmm. and then how you chose to get started in it, especially coming from a background of like it was a ballet, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. Yeah, so um, we focus on significant life change, just like you do, mm -hmm. but from the basis of optimizing our health, dropping weight and sustainably maintaining it. And we have a really intensive approach, a, a different look at it. We really challenge the conventional ways of thinking when it comes to nutrition and weight loss, looking at it from a behavioral approach as well, not just the science of when and what and how much to eat, that's definitely there but understanding that 80% of any life change and dropping weight definitely classifies comes from the mind. Sure. So looking at individuals as a whole person, the mental, emotional, the habits and behaviors. I, I, I guess the truth is that on, I mean, we can go to YouTube or do a Google search and mm -hmm. find what to eat and mm -hmm. how to eat, whether mm -hmm. it's macros or keto or, there's no shortage of what to eat and how to eat, to mm -hmm. lose weight mm -hmm. or to build muscle to burn fat, uh, yet when you look at the population that's overweight or morbidly overweight, I think collectively it's like, like in the high 60s, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, right? about 72% of us are struggling with obesity or overweight. There you go, so 72% uh -huh. of the population is struggling with obesity and being overweight, mm -hmm. yet the information is so readily available on how to do it, mm -hmm. then clearly the how-to isn't so much the problem, it's mm -hmm. the operating system, The the brain, the behaviors, the mindset, the emotions, mm -hmm. and seems to me the way you've really grown the PhD weight loss, you have, is it four locations now? Five. Five, that's right, we just opened five. Uh -huh. And you have five locations, and of course we're pivoting to, which is something you had done even earlier than the pandemic, if I'm not mistaken, yes, right? The you're online, right. online piece. Mm -hmm. uh, but we really want to, in this coaching program that you're doing with me, we really want to take the online piece and just blow it up where we can mm -hmm. serve exponentially more people. But uh, in the process of helping people with the significant life change, what have you found? Is there two or three things that really contributes like when you guys help them have these breakthroughs in these mm -hmm. areas of life, and hopefully you'll tell me what they are. What are those areas of life where once we do this, then the results come and stick? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. So. I think that really we're not just in the field of weight loss, but in the field of addiction recovery. Mm -hmm. So understanding that, that it's about breaking the ties with the foods that we say we love that just aren't loving us back. Ooh. It's like a bad relationship and recognizing that. Mm -hmm. I think the concept of just eat everything in moderation is really difficult and has caused a lot of pain for a lot of people because there are just some foods that we are wired to not be able to eat in moderation. Give me an example. Like well, what? like ice cream for me. Okay. okay. So like we all have favorite foods. Like, we all have so you're a sweet things. person, I'm a salty person. That's for right. I, I love pretzels. I even talk yeah. about it on my posts. Uh -huh. Yeah, okay, so there's certain uh -huh. foods that we may not be wired to eat in moderation. Yeah. So what do we do with that? <laughs> well, we have to let those foods go in, in a lot of senses and put our big girl, big boy pants on, be like, okay, if I need to drop weight and be my best self, then I'm not gonna have those foods in the house. I'm just not gonna be able to eat those. It's like sure. telling an alcoholic that they can have one drink. Oof. Uh, you, it, 
Yeah. You, you can't do that. Slippery slope. It's a slippery slope. And so understanding that. Also, I find teaching the body how to become fat adapted is a really great tool Explain for a lot me. of people. So fat adapted. Yeah. So teaching the body how to burn fat for fuel. And that looks different for each person. But when we can get the body into that state, then we find that cravings and hunger really drop down. So we're able to eat and make decisions that actually support our body's best health. Brilliant. So you brought up the word addiction. Is it, mm -hmm. are, you, are you implying addiction to food or maybe other addictions that lead people to eating food for comfort? Both. Ex so, can you explain yeah. both to, to mm -hmm. us? So from an addiction to food standpoint, so here's what happens metabolically. This is a little bit of a long story. Is that okay? I'll take it. All right. So what happens in our lives is we have these triggers and these triggers change the way that we tolerate our food. And so we can continue to eat the way we did before the trigger, but now it results in weight gain instead. And we're thinking, you know, what the heck is going on? I haven't changed anything, but I'm starting to accumulate this fat. A uh, trigger might be for a guy, it could be a major stress event, uh, stress in the relationship, a divorce, um, stress in their job, a job change. Um, general aging can be a trigger. For women, it might be uh, menopause or pregnancy or some kind of stress event. And it just shifts how we can tolerate our food. And so now our metabolism tolerates differently. We put on this fat and when this fat goes in the belly, it's a different beast. This belly fat, it's called visceral fat, and it fills up the organs, it wraps around them, and it squeezes them tight like a straight jacket. Oh, wow. So after you've had this fat in there for a while, it actually grows its own blood vessels. It gets a little oxygen supply, and it secretes hormones at the tissue level. So what you have in the belly is this hungry, active fat mass that is addicted to food. It secretes hormones that make you hungry, make you crave, slow your metabolism so you can literally look at a piece of pizza and a beer and gain five pounds, and makes you lazy because the last thing this hungry fat mass wants you to do is go expend a ton of energy. I want you to think of it like a tumor and all it wants to do is get fatter as fast as possible. Oh my God. And so that's what I mean from a metabolic situation that we're addicted to this food, we are hungry and we're starving inside. So I really believe that weight gain isn't our fault. It has nothing to do with you. It's not a flaw in willpower or a lack of discipline. It's all hormonally regulated by this hungry fat mass tumor that just wants to get fatter as fast as possible. Hmm. hmm. So, you know, it's interesting about that. Um, some 22, 25 years ago when I was a personal trainer, had my gyms. I had, uh, I had four personal training gyms. Uh, it's funny, today, these days, we have hundreds of Fit Body Bootcamp mm -hmm. locations worldwide, but I don't work in them. I'm furthest away from coaching clients, unfortunately, and I still love that. Um, but I love what I do and help the, in terms of serving people, so that's my mission. But when I had my four gyms, in every one of my gyms, I had Remember that five pounds of fat that you could buy? Yeah, I, I have a few of those. All right, okay, I, I was gonna ask you. And then, and then there was like the pound of muscle that was yeah. like really dense and tight. Uh -huh. And then there was the five pounds of fat. And I remember one day I was uh, just really kind of just studying that five pounds of fat. And I noticed in it the thin little capillaries. Yeah. Right? It's got like, and I, I was very curious. So I got a, a, a pen uh -huh. and I started kind of picking at it. And it was just like red, whatever, like thread or fiber yeah. that they used. And then that led me to doing more research and exactly what you said, like how, well, first of all, just, I remember thinking, this is gross. Mm -hmm. The fact that this fat that's not supposed to be here has now grown capillaries mm -hmm. to provide blood supply and oxygen and only for the, the sole purpose to get bigger. That's right. It, and I never heard it used, the term used like, like see it as a tumor mm -hmm. because it really is. I mean, we need some body fat on our bodies, yeah. but this excess that we have is a tumor, the equivalent of a tumor that's mm -hmm. uh, to say that it's like squeezing our organs, which automatically then tell me is our kidney, liver, our lungs, are these things functioning properly when they have, they don't have the room 
to function and move the way yeah, it's supposed no, to. Yeah, no, our body is just inefficient. It's not working the way that it's supposed to. When we carry this fat in the belly, if you were to take a slice of your liver in that situation, it would look like a Kobe beef steak. Oof. That's fatty liver, right? That marbling that's in there. So it infiltrates everything. It's crazy. So it's not just visceral fat. It, it, at what point Will it start kind of, I guess, for lack of a better term, bleeding into our organs like that? Yeah. Uh, what, I mean, that's going to differ according to each person and where they store the fat. Yeah. I find that we um, drop weight in the opposite direction that we put it on. Okay. So it just, it, it's different. Some people put it on in the belly first and it starts to just overflow like a sink that's overflowing. Mm -hmm. Other people, they'll put it on in their legs first and when, and when they don't have any more buckets, then it starts to pack in into the belly. Gotcha. Um, yeah. Got it. And then mm -hmm. you, you, you burn it off in reverse. Yeah, So that that's last right. person you talked about would burn it off the belly first and they they're, lose Yeah, the, and they're lucky because yeah. that's, not, that's not the usual pattern that I right. see. Yeah, usually it's the belly. First. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, which is also the most dangerous being that's closest right. to the heart. Yeah, right? and that visceral fat specifically, that fat in the belly is that active fat. It's different than the fat throughout the rest of the body. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. What have you guys found in terms of addiction? Because, I mean, with five locations now, I mean, you, you guys work with so many people mm. who want to lose weight. And they may come to you for a multitude of reasons. Hey, I want to lose weight because I want clothes to fit better. I want to lose weight because my doctor says I need to. Or I want to lose weight because, like, I'm now diabetic or some other mm -hmm. kind of health, like serious health problem. Yeah. Um, how do you guys identify if someone's got an addiction where they're using food as the comfort or emotional component? Well, we do a lot of behavioral work, um, working through that aspect and having awareness, recognizing if they're eating truly out of hunger or if they're eating out of some way to sabotage their best intentions or if they're eating to cover other situations yeah. and appeasing their mind and increasing serotonin and those feel-good neurotransmitters in another way, just like why we might drink or do drugs or some other aspect. Mm. So helping them come to realize why they're eating, how they're eating. Uh, we have different modalities that we use too, specifically audio sessions that work with binaural beats to repattern the neural pathways in the brain to change the way that we think and feel. I think it just, it's a mindset shift yeah. and it's a big um, situation where we allow for more awareness in why we're acting the way that we are. Interesting. And uh, one, one other question that I'm curious about that I bet our audience is curious about and then we'll shift to like the business side mm -hmm. of it because I always love learning like what the product or service is and then what's the business of that product or service. It's so neat to get a view behind the scenes. How did this pandemic affect people, if, if it even affected, them, affected mm -hmm. them in a different way? Did you see any changes in your clients coming to, whether in attitude or in mood or more body fat or fat being stored differently because of this? I'm just curious because the cross section yeah. of people you guys get to see. Yeah, so we're busier than ever. And I think it's because we're recognizing as a community that we have to take responsibility for our health. You know, we're recognizing yeah. that, you know, even the vaccination isn't working the way that we expect it to. So what do we have? Yeah. We only have our health. So they're stepping up more and taking action. And I think almost reframing this as an opportunity to do something that they've known they've wanted to do or mm -hmm. should have done for a very long time. And now they have this perfect excuse yeah to step up and just do something that might make them uncomfortable at the beginning and is scary for some people. Um, because I think a lot of people come in with weight thinking that it's their fault, that there's shame and guilt and unworthiness associated with it. Well, we let go of all that. There is no shame or guilt associated with it at all. You know, I look at what we do just as hiring a coach. Mm -hmm. It is yeah. no different. I think the most successful people in the world probably have coaches. I agree. I mean, I have you. Yeah. <laughs> and I have a speaking coach currently because I want to become you? even better from the stage. Yeah. 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 I mean, you've got to be coachable. Yeah. And there's no shame or guilt about mm -hmm. that. I can't think of one athlete 
who doesn't have a coach, recreational or, or, or elite, right? Yeah. Any level. So there's no shame or guilt having someone to look from the outside and pinpoint what's going on. And just like you said, there's so many misconceptions associated with nutrition and weight loss. And I think everyone and their brother professes to be a nutrition yeah. expert. And it's daunting. It gets overwhelming because then yeah. you go, well, that person looks good and they're preaching this carnivore diet. Mm -hmm. That person looks good. They're vegan. And they're <laughs> vegan. And that person says, you know, keto, like, I, I want to look like all three of them. Uh, but what happened? But it's those, it works for them, but it may not work for you. Yeah. Or it may work for you, but you've got this barrier mentally, right? That's right. Or stressor that might be kind of altering your metabolism mm -hmm. and the way you're storing fat. Yeah. And it's neat that you guys, you know, really dive deep on that. What we found at Fit Body Bootcamp is uh, we kind of lure people in by saying, look, you know, just 30 minutes a day at a Fit Body Bootcamp, three to five days a week, and you're going to get amazing results. Mm -hmm. And we sell them on what they want, which is, you know, short workouts, 30 mm -hmm. minutes a day. I could do 30 minutes a day, three to five days a week. But what they don't realize is they're completely buying into a mindset and nutrition program where when we add them to our private Facebook groups and when mm -hmm. we start the education process, when they're not in the gyms with us, it's the deep dive into, you know, emotional triggers, emotional eating, you know, willpower. Like, gee, we could all avoid that bagel and cream cheese in the morning, but in the at the end of the day, mm -hmm. that same bagel and cream cheese on the counter, somehow the willpower is not there. And so it going wins back out. To, yeah, <laughs> right? And going back to what you said, and I think there were studies that said when something's out of reach, you're two times less likely to eat it. When it's out of sight, you're seven times more likely to eat it. And when it's like not even in the house, you're not likely to eat it. Mm -hmm. uh, so it makes sense to not have the thing in the house that's going to trigger you to overeat it. Mm -hmm. And I have been known to go through a whole bag of Dots pretzels. You, you know. really love those pretzels, huh? Oh man, I haven't met a pretzel, a soft pretzel, a hard pretzel, pretzel bread, uh, peanut butter filled pretzels. I haven't met really? a pretzel, pretzel chips. Pretzel I haven't met chips. a pretzel that I don't like. Yeah, huh. uh, it's a whole different pot that's what I would do. <laughs> um, so anyway, w w with that said, let's kind of shift gears into, you know, your background, Mm -hmm. and why you chose to go into, you know, weight loss specifically and um, how you got into ballet. We just learn more about you. So Yeah. Um, so I started training in ballet when I was a really young girl, three years old. My mom put me in it, and I was not good. I didn't have any natural talent. And I was always in the back row. But I didn't let it get me down, and instead it just ignited this fire, like, gosh darn it, mediocrity, mediocrity or not being the best is not okay for me, at least sure. in, in the front, you know. And so I pushed really hard, and my body didn't conform easily, and so I was always injured. I think I performed in probably 600 nutcrackers, wow. and I had at least one stress fracture in one or both feet, I'd say, for over half of them. Um, when I was in high school, I had a really bad stress fracture in my back, and uh, the doctor said that I had to wear this really long, big, thick, molded back brace, and I decided that I'd wear Sexy. it. Yeah, I know, I was really popular. <laughs> in high school, about, uh, yeah. like the time where everyone's got to poke uh, fun. High school, yeah, so I, I was a really great place for people to play knock-knock jokes, Aww. but I was not popular, but I, I just kept pushing through, and so I, I had a pretty successful career, and I danced with companies across the country, and um, the accumulation of my career was when I was chosen to perform in New York, and I landed there, but instead of finding myself in the spotlight doing all of these once in a lifetime performances, I found myself in the ER. I thought I was having a heart attack. I didn't know what was going on. I was so fearful for my health. And the neurologist came back and said that I was simply underfed and overexercised. Oh, wow. Um, and I was just, my body broke down. Just shutting down. That's it. It just could not take it anymore, and I had to step away. And, and so, how old were you at this point? Um, I was probably 24. Okay. And, mm -hmm. and what's running through your head when the doctor's telling you this? Well, I just felt like, number one, a failure. You know, I had to step away from that career, which was my identity. And it might not seem like a big deal, but I, it was 20 plus years of my sure. entire life of struggle and sacrifice and pain and passion. And I had no idea what I was going to do with myself. Huh. Uh, so I was flown home. I was, I'm sure, depressed and anxious. 
I was used to dancing eight hours a day, every day, and all I thought about. Did you just have like a ravenous appetite? I mean, I imagine dancing <laughs> eight hours a day. I just picture Michael Phelps at his peak. Uh -huh. like they said he would burn like something like six or 7,000 calories a day. We are a really unique population because we are required to have such aesthetic demands that I chronically restricted myself to try to meet the demands and I was still told I was fat countless times. Oh my God. I counted fat grams. I remember days where I would eat, you know, maybe five grams of fat in a day because I thought that if you eat fat, you get fat, which now we know isn't true. Right. Um, and I believe that's why I was chronically injured and why my body was just done. It was, there was just too much stress. And I'm, I'm leaner today than I ever was when I was dancing and I eat more and move less, but that's because I, I, I know what to do. You and, understand. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. My gosh. And, and, and so now here you are 24, you're flying back. Mm -hmm. and I, I know I would at that point be depressed, anxious, overwhelmed. What does my future look like? Mm -hmm. So how does that shift happen into um, kind of finding your path? Yeah, well, I looked around, I looked at dentistry and I was like falling asleep while I, no offense to any dentists, but it just wasn't for Three me. Three of my coaching clients are dentists. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm gonna give them your number. Like, yeah. Yeah. yeah, there's yeah. really techie, there's lots of equipment. I'm not a techie person. Yeah. It just wasn't for me. I, I considered, you know, going to med school, but I don't deal well with really sick, sick people, like in, in trauma, traumatic yeah. states. You know, my yeah. husband is a physician and he can deal with broken bones and I, I'm more on the preventive, right. you know, let's catch it before it gets to that, that point. And so I just understood how significantly nutrition or really lack thereof impacted my own sport performance. So that's how I went in and got, ended up earning my PhD in sports nutrition and chronic disease. Okay. Okay. So that's what happened next is sports nutrition, mm -hmm. and PhD in sports nutrition, chronic disease. And did you think at that point you're going to be a coach or a trainer, maybe dietitian? Yeah, kind of I thought, you know, I really liked the research and what I wanted to learn was I wanted to learn what happens to all of us chronic dieters. Uh, what, there has to be a way that we can actually eat and maintain this lean body composition or whatever healthy body composition we need. And so what happens metabolically inside mm. and how do we do this in a way that's healthy and supports our body? And then most importantly, we know mentally and emotionally, behaviorally, what do we need to do to create sustainable change? And so that's what I studied. And I thought maybe I'd work with athletes. So that's why I focused on sports nutrition and the female athlete triad and all of these things. So I went on and taught at the Ohio State University for a while okay. and recognized that I'm not very patient and I have to see dramatic change in individuals pretty quickly. Mm. You know, I, I'm probably similar to you. Yeah, you like yeah. to see people make wild transformations. Type A, tightly wound uh -huh. driver. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's that like be, yeah. you and every single one of my coaching clients mm -hmm. and me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you know what's funny is I thought I had, uh, for all of you listening and watching this right now, and you hear, you hear Ashley say that, when you are this way and others around you aren't, you feel like maybe there's something wrong with me. Do mm -hmm. I have OCD? Am I, am I, do I have some weird disorder? Am I neurotic? And then when I started, you know, 15 years ago, started taking on coaching clients and then found that, man, this athlete that I'm working with me is type A, tightly wound driver. Oh my gosh, look, I'm working with these Navy SEALs. I'm working with these Army Rangers. I'm working with these Marine recon guys. I'm working with these like jujitsu guys. And now I've got three doctors, three dentists, a PhD. Oh, look at that. We're all cut from the same cloth. Mm -hmm. And when you see how much impact we make and how much, how short of a time, and it's never short enough for us. Mm -hmm. um, I realized, wait a minute, we're just a very different flock of birds. Mm -hmm. I like um, looking at it like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it, we're, we're unique and I don't think many people can walk in our shoes. Um, and I think that's just by design. I don't think many people should walk in our shoes. Mm -hmm. I don't believe I can go and knock down a door and kill 10 bad guys and tell who the good guy is and not kill them. Um, but I can, in my world, be very high speed, low drag, and you in your world. And mm -hmm. once you find a similar flock of birds, you're like, oh, I'm not crazy. They're just, we're just endangered. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of us. We're endangered species. <laughs> we really are. My wife always tells me, she goes, you yeah, know, you're an endangered species. I'm like, oh. well, 
I, I, I know more of us. You know, I almost mm -hmm. got we got to be in captivity or something, but we, we have to spread our wings and fly. Mm -hmm. I like that. Yeah. So so you realize, hey, I'm not, I'm, 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 I can't be this patient mm -hmm. and this isn't for me. I'm guessing this is leading to maybe I have to be my own boss. Yeah. Well, I actually went back to school again. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When did that go back to school? <laughs> Um, and I, I went back to school because I just felt like I needed to be this, this true expert in the field of nutrition and weight management. So I went on, completed my dietetic internship after I got, I earned my PhD okay. and became a registered dietitian. But there was a problem with everything I was learning. It was still all of the conventional wisdom, the calories in, calories out, have more willpower. And I knew that didn't work for me personally. Mm -hmm. And so I flipped everything that I learned upside down, studied all this other stuff on the side, took my research and created this really unique protocol, which is part of the reason why I have so much fun is because if it was the usual mantra, then I, I, I would be bored. Sure. And so we've, you know, just through all of this, found this different approach that really, really works and cr creates profound change in people. And it's pretty simple. And so with that, um, you know, I started working a lot with athletes and found what had a significant impact on those individuals had a more profound impact on those of us struggling with excess weight and poor health. So I started off just with myself. Um, I was in a very small town. We still have an office in Durango, Colorado, yeah. but I had, I think it was 700 square feet and I was fearful I wouldn't be able to pay the rent. My mother told me, she's like, if you can't pay this rent, then you just need to stay home. <laughs> yeah, was um, and so I just did it and I put a few ads on the radio and I put my cell phone as the call to action yeah. on How the radio. Was this? this was six years ago. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I was in Walmart. I had a two and a three and a half year old boy at the time. I was a stay at home mom yeah. and I had my cell phone on the radio spots. And I remember being in Walmart and the phone ringing the first time, like boys just go play in the, the toy aisle and I'm going to answer this phone call. That's how it started. Good for you. Yeah. Good for you. So in what six and a half years? Mm -hmm. Now you're. We just. You know. You're open. Your new location opened up a couple months ago. July. Right? Yeah. Yeah. July, mm -hmm. which is your fifth location. Um, and when you look at that, you're at a clip of like about one every nine months. About so. Right. Mm-hmm. Or no, I'm sorry. About one every a every year. Year. year yeah, slightly over a year. Yeah, like our first or so. two, yeah. um, we I stayed with for a little bit of time, yeah. deciding what did I want to do and would I be happy just with with these two offices. And I felt this moral obligation to serve more people. I just wasn't satisfied. I felt like I could do more, and that it was just something that I had to do to serve more people. And so we actually that was the toughest decision I would say of a big decision of our lives. We had two boys and then I was 36 weeks pregnant with our third child yeah. and we had built our dream house in Colorado and we decided to move so that we could build and serve more people. Um, so that was a big choice. Okay. So let's talk about that. When you're, when you're looking to open up a location, and it doesn't matter really what the person is. If you're if you're listening to this and you're a, a trainer, you want to open up a gym. You're a dentist. You're, you know, you you want to open any kind of an office. What are the kind of things you're looking for, Ashley, in terms of maybe geography, in terms of population, in terms of uh, demographics, mm -hmm. income, and then kind of venturing into signing a lease, et cetera. What, what are some of the hints that you can drop that would help? Yeah, that, that's a great question because we've had a big variety actually. We knew that we had and still have great success in Durango, Colorado, which is you know 16,000 people, very small community. Right. And so we decided that we wanted to be in a little bit of a larger community. We also looked at it from a selfish point of view, where would we like to raise our three kids yeah. and where would be a good um, quality of life? But in those areas, people who are, have the desire to change, mm -hmm. we also require a specific you know, demographic who can afford our services. Um, so looking at that and if it's in, uh, yeah, an area where people invest in their health 
And so that's generally where we have searched out. So, so you're looking for places where you know, you know health, fitness, wellness is yeah, accepted or popular. That's right. So Asheville, North Carolina, for example, sure. people are out river doing the the river rafting and mountain biking. There's kind of skiing out there, mm -hmm. lots of hiking, and so people are really invested in their health and well-being. Okay, and when you're looking for a lease to sign like what are the things that you try and negotiate into a lease that, that would be in your favor mm -hmm. well ti allowance okay. so trying to have um, the the landlord or the leaser mm -hmm. <laughs> um, put some kind of money in toward yeah. the uplift yeah so ti guys and gals watching and listening is tenant improvement and it's really a cool thing where you can say, look, I will sign a five-year lease instead of a three-year lease if you're willing to help me build out the inside of this place to suit me. Mm -hmm. Because ultimately, after the five-year lease, if you leave, it's not like you're taking that with you. Mm -hmm. And so it's theirs anyway. Mm -hmm. And so you're always looking for a TI allowance. Yep. A lot of... in. Uh a lot of landlords want 10-year or seven-year leases, and we would always talk them down to five. Gotcha. Um, with the TI allowance in there. Got it. Um, and then there are different things that they add to the rent, like CAM and such. So trying to get that down as much as possible yeah. is what we would go and The CAM go is kind of like the parking lot, clean up, uh -huh. the association things, and um, which they do pad the rent through the camp, so it is they very negotiable. Do. In some contracts, yeah. it'll be also known as a triple net. That's right. Um, yeah, very good point. And what about, do you ever try and get any free, couple of free months? Yeah, that's on great. On the front end in yes. terms of build out? Uh-huh, so we'll either ask for, we've done it differently each time, but either maybe once we open two months of no rent, or um, the build out, maybe we'll say six months, no rent, and we get the build out done in four months. So it allows us to have Couple two months, months yeah. of, of free rent. Perfect, mm -hmm. perfect. Any other kind of hints in terms of negotiating a lease or do's and don'ts of a lease that you would? I think those are, that's primarily it. Signage, I think, is really, really important. So yeah. just looking at that and adding that as a part of the lease, because oftentimes they'll just knock that out. Um, and you won't have any kind of monument signs there, which I find for drive-bys is important for us. Gotcha, so signage on the building is a given. Signage mm -hmm. on the monument out there in the front of the complex, you've gotta really work it in there because they might have, whatever, 50 stores, but on the monument, they only have spot for 20 um, signs That's that they right. can put up. Yeah, so yeah. that does have to be worked into there. And then looking at the bigger aspects like AC or HVAC, sometimes if you sign the lease, it's as is. And the AC or HVAC, it could be 15 years old and you get there and it breaks down. So making sure that you have someone take a look at it and tell you what the status is so you can potentially work that in there. That is a really good point because when I bought this building, um, I bought this building four years ago up on the roof, I think there is five, six, seven, eight units to, to air condition this whole building. And um, we had a company come out and look at it. They said, hey, these are old units. And historically, it might kind of break down in the next three mm -hmm. three years. It might You might eke out another three years out of it inefficiently. And so I was able to get a discount off the purchase price of the building. Right. Uh, they went towards that should it break down. And, and true mm -hmm. enough, actually within a year, they broke down and Did it. we spent the money. And uh, so that's a very, very good point there. Mm -hmm. And you can do that whether you're leasing or purchasing a building. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So in terms of now, okay, you've, you've, you've leased a building, you've got it, it's being built out. How do you start, what are all the marketing funnels or marketing poles that you put in the water? Yeah, so for us, we're a little unique and we've found um, great benefit from radio. Yeah. So we do radio advertising everywhere. And usually we'll start by um, having some radio celebrity, is what I like to call them, mm -hmm. start working with us. We have a lot of integrity built into anyone who talks about what we do, and I want them to experience some kind of change in their work with us. So we don't sure. have any kind of endorser who's not actually working with us. Um, I, that's really important to me. Um, and so we'll have them start with us maybe six weeks before, maybe two months before, because we want to see them make change and witness, um, mm -hmm. you know, 
change within themselves before they start talking about what we do. And then maybe four weeks before they start to go on air, mention our grand opening and such. Gotcha. And so you're, you're, you're running radio campaigns, radio ads. Mm -hmm. The best case scenario is that the host of, let's say whether, and most of them are talk radio, correct? Most or sports. <clears throat> okay, talk or sports. Mm -hmm. And in the best case scenario, because there's two types of radio ads. There's radio ads where they go, hey, okay, now we're going to take a little break and hear from our sponsors, and you'll just hear an ad. Mm -hmm. But then you always hear those ones where the hosts themselves go, hey, have you considered doing this? If you have, you might want to consider so-and-so because I've lost 14 pounds there. That's right. Or I got my Lasix there. Yeah. There's a place out here called, uh, in Montclair called Cunning Dental, and uh, there's a radio station I listen to, and the host says, you know, he goes, he goes hey, I got... I got all uh, dental implants. He goes, I just had horrible teeth and I got dental implants. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. Like, as long as he's willing to share it, like, I don't need dental implants. My teeth are fine. But it's like, you know what? I like this host. And after, if I ever wanted to go to a dentist to get dental implants, like, mm -hmm. that's the place I'd go to because I really value this guy's opinion and, yeah, and what trust he does. Him. Mm -hmm. And so that's clever. So what is the ad's... Uh, kind of call to action mechanism? Is it to go to a website, to mm -hmm. give a, a call? So for us, it's all about calling in. Okay. And so we might direct them to go to the website, but then our phone number is everywhere. Yeah. Sometimes we'll just cut to the chase, which we've found lately actually works really well is to just put the phone number. You want to have a direct call to action. So if we want them to call, we're just going to put the phone number there mm -hmm. and direct them to call us. And that's been helpful in the last few months, actually. Perfect. So. Mm -hmm. They call you, and of course, when they're calling, um, I guess depending on where they're at, the, the, does it go directly to a person at that location? It does. And do you have mm -hmm. set people, or just someone randomly picks up the phone? All of our all of our team are trained to pick up the phone, and I'm obsessed with that, mm -hmm. <laughs> and how I we train, yeah. <laughs> how we train and role play and do all of these things so that our team feels confident. Yeah. Um, we also track the calls in and what percentage of them are booking. And if they're not booking, why is that? So we really look so at those numbers. So when we say booking, are we looking for a two-step? And like I know the answer, mm -hmm. but obviously I'm speaking on behalf of the audience here, yeah. so bear with me. Are we looking for a two-step, meaning we book them for a face-to-face -face right. consultation? Yes. And mm -hmm. what percentage of the people that call do you find end up booking for a face-to-face? -face. About 98%. 98%. Mm -hmm. Now, people listening to this are like, holy crap, that is nuts. Mm -hmm. What exactly happens on that phone call where you get such a, because I had never heard of such a high mm -hmm. booking rate. And we know that not everyone shows up to the consultation. That's, that's right. A, that's a given. Yeah. But a 98% booking rate is just bananas. That's mm -hmm. through the roof. What do you do that's unique or special? Um, well, because what's what, really crazy is it's not just you doing it like this no. is replicated across five locations. So yes. you're, you're not even picking up the phone yourself. Yeah. It's other humans. Um, so, well, just the, the speak that we use on uh, the physiology, I think the tone of voice is really important. Understanding for a lot of our clients, it takes maybe six months for someone to work up the courage to give us a call just because of what we do. Sure. And so that person, the, the voice over the phone, making them feel comfort, comforted and welcomed is really important. I think more than what we're saying is that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then we just are really good at establishing value. We Right now, we don't say what the cost is over the phone. It's different for each person anyway. And so we just really encourage them and let them know that they're going to get a lot of great information, even if they're not ready to get started to give us a call. We give them dual appointment options and guide them in the direction that we want to see them head. Perfect. So, you know, um, would, you know, how about tomorrow at either 10 or 3 o'clock? What, what time would that, you know, which of those would work best for you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so just our speak is really specific um, in guiding them to actually come in and see us. So there's a lot to unpack here. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help our audience unpack this. Uh, number one, what you, what you, one, you don't tell them the price over the phone mm -hmm. because, or, and it's not on the website, mm -mm. because the moment you tell them the price, they begin to judge you on price and not on the value. Yeah, you can't gonna... really establish value over a, a quick call. Exactly. So what happens if someone goes, yeah, but I just want to know what you guys cost? Mm -hmm. 
So we would say, um, you know, we, we totally respect that, but the cost of the program is truly customized to you. And we're not going to be able to understand what your goals are, what your needs are until you come on in. And so, you know, we promise you that you'll get a lot of great information and you will walk away knowing exactly how long your program is and what the total cost is at, at, at that point. Brilliant. So guys, there's your answer to that. Cause I, that's, I hear that often. It's like, Pedro, you always say, don't put your prices on your website. And when people call, don't give them your prices. There's what you say. It's like, it's a custom program. We need to figure out what your needs and wants are. And when we do, we promise you that you're going to get a ton of great information, even if you choose not to do it. And mm -hmm. that piece is called risk reversal because they know that there's a risk to them coming in. You might pressure me into buying this thing and you might make me feel like I'm a jerk for not buying it. And your tonality and the way you guys show up in terms of how you care over the phone, plus the fact that you say, even if you choose not to commit to the decision today, it gives them a way out. Mm -hmm. It reverses the risk. And they go, you know what, what do I have to lose? Uh, they're gonna tell me what a custom program would be and if it works for me, I'll do it. And so now you've got that. And the third piece I wanted to unpack was to always guide them towards the outcome you want mm -hmm. while giving them the perception of control. Mm -hmm. And that is that, oh, great. Well, listen, uh, let me give some options when you can come in. How about tomorrow, either 5 p.m. or 7 p.m.? Mm -hmm. You know that you have those two appointment times open, but you gave them two options, which gives them the element or the feeling of control. Well, if they choose five, it was their decision, yeah. right? Or if they mm -hmm. say, no, that won't work, uh, what's another day? You might say, well, I've got Wednesday at 3 p.m. or 6 p.m., right? We always yeah, want to there's kinda... always two options. Mm -hmm. as, and for what we do, as close to the time as they call in, because again, from an addiction recovery standpoint, anything can sabotage at any time. Right. So we really look at us as like a day of a walk-in clinic. Bingo. And um, so let me add to that real quick, just because my OCD locks on, because I just want to coach the world if I can for a moment. Guys, when someone calls you, emails you, DMs you, shows interest, recency, frequency, monetary is what matters. The monetary piece I'm not going to talk about right now, but recency, frequency is what matters, meaning how quickly can you answer the phone? If you can get to them in the next 10 minutes, that is when they're hottest. If you're like, yeah, but I'm busy training, coaching, uh, doing whatever, so I get to them at the end of the day, by that point, when someone's like, I'm looking for a nutrition coach, a diet coach, a fitness coach, a mindset coach, a money coach, they're not just calling you. They just you maybe heard your ad and called you, but if they left a voicemail, they're probably doing a Google search somewhere and mm -hmm. saying, who else does weight loss? and they're calling the next person, the next person, the next person. So recency, meaning how quickly you could pick up the phone. Our best case scenario is the phone rings, you pick it up, uh, versus they leave a voicemail and you answer. Um, or the email comes in and you're responding within minutes, not hours, minutes. And then the frequency is, if you missed them, how frequently you can follow up with enthusiasm, passion, and excitement, because as, as Ashley said, they are hottest right then and there, and every minute that passes, they're getting colder and colder and colder, or they're seeking out another solution, uh, which may not be yours, in which case, if you really feel you're the best at what you do, you've got a duty and a moral obligation to persist with, with passion, just chase them down and get them to become clients and customers. So let's say we get them into your location now, Ashley. Mm -hmm. What percentage actually show up of the 98% of the book? Mm. You know, that's a great question. And we do have those statistics, but I would just be shooting off the top of my head. Let's say um, we have also email campaigns that go out to help encourage them. Yeah. So I would say still probably 80% of clients show up to their appointment. Got it. So when they show up, is there, and I know there's a lot of like, specific assessment, probably digging in into what they want, mm -hmm. what made them want to do this now, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But is there any um, strategies that you found that when used across your five locations really increase the odds of sales conversion? Mm, there's so much that goes into what we do in our initial consultation. Okay. Um, the, the biggest thing, again, is the consultant's tone of voice and physiology yeah. and being charismatic and truly wanting to go in and make sick people well. Yeah. 
having a passion and with, with their whole being of serving people because they see these transformations that we're, we're doing every day with hundreds of people. And so I think the person is really important, how they can connect mm -hmm. and how they can be, bring out the honest truth and the client that they're sitting with is yeah. the biggest deal. We have script, we have you know, specific protocol to follow, um, but that and just hearing the person and believing in what we do, I think is the number one most important thing. And uh, to that point, I'm a thousand percent with you. And I'm going through that process right now as the potential customer. So there's this, there's this uh, custom automaker in Texas and a specific vehicle that I want. And I want this vehicle in a very specific way. And then I want them to do very specific things to the engine and then flatbed it out to me. Um, I love vehicles. And so I emailed them. I've never purchased one from them. I've purchased from other you know, auction sites, et cetera, or, or tuners. And the guy, so even though I want it, I have the money, like I know I'm gonna get it, whether through them or someone else, when I emailed through the website, the guy just kind of came off, for lack of a better word, he seemed rushed in his email. Mm. He seemed to be pressuring me, like kind of, hey, you know what, there is one of those vehicles we can get uh, and then bring into our um, garage to tune up for you exactly that you want. And ironically, there's only one spot left in our garage. So like you need to make a decision. It's like, we haven't even gotten on the phone yet, man. <laughs> like don't, and I've got the money, like I can pay in full, right? But I found myself already kind of on my heels. Yeah. And I'm like, all right, man, what are you feeling right now? And I realized as much as like, I know I'm gonna get this vehicle no matter what, and I'd rather get it through them because they're very reputable in terms of their tuners. And I get it, this guy's a sales guy and he's gonna make a lot of money on this big transaction. But his approach made me just kind of take a pause. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, do I just call and maybe just ask for the owner and maybe deal with that guy? Mm -hmm. Or if, if he had come up with the, if he had like, man, you're, you wanna get that particular vehicle and have our team do that? Well, shoot. You know, we've done three of those, and I've got the test drive in one or something. And he just talked to me like two guys would talk about cars. Yeah, it would be a very different thing. Mm -hmm. Excited for you. Yes, mm -hmm. excited for me, happy for me. Mm -hmm. Like you're making the right decision. Yeah. Versus there's only one spot left in the tuner's garage, and because we've got 90 other cars that we're working on, mm -hmm. I was like, come on, don't do that. You yeah. know. So that that is a very big thing, and and that's just a fun novelty thing that I'm buying when someone's really thinking about their health and they're gonna mm -hmm. trust you with their body, like they better have that connection, the care, tonality, yeah. enthusiasm, and not just seem like uh, a sale is being made, right? Yeah. Yeah, good for you guys. And so um, in terms of this next evolution of really taking the PhD weight loss and going online, what mm -hmm. are the goals that we're shooting for. Interestingly enough, we're, we're right after this episode, we're going to go upstairs and do your half day coaching session. And so we'll, we'll break it down. But mm -hmm. this is a question I was going to ask up, upstairs anyway, like in 12 months, what is the outcome that we want from the PhD weight loss online component? Yeah, that's a great question. So right now we're probably seeing about 25 clients a month nationwide. Um, I think it would be great to double that um, sure. in the next six months or so, because I know that we have the capacity and there's a way to do that, but that's, I have to figure out the how. Yeah. Right now, again, we're, we're doing nationally syndicated radio for that, and we're getting better and better at those spots and, and how to tackle those individuals from um, a logistical avenue, because it's lots of different logistics going on with Nationwide at Home. There's yeah. shipping. There's inventory because we provide 85% of the food for our clients, right? right? So there's all of that involved. Yeah. So we've actually had to make our nationwide presence almost like a brick and mortar location. It's in one of our current brick and mortar locations, but we've had to structure it and the team and have a team leader. So we've really kind of pulled it out and made it its own thing so we can focus on it gotcha. rather than it just be a, a part of something else. Yeah. So I think even just with that shift of focus, and that there's a space mentally for it, we'll see it take off. Yeah. Um, and to that point, you said, well, you know, in the next six months, I'd like to double 
the number of people were, that we're serving. Um, and I want to bring up the fact that two things. You charge a premium for what you do. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not a $29 nutrition plan. No. Like, without having to throw it out, it's several thousand dollars. Yeah. Right? And it should be. Mm -hmm. It's a premium. You guys are the best at what you do. Mm -hmm. uh, and the results and the before and after pictures are just phenomenal. Mm -hmm. So, you know, doubling 25 to 50 people, like, that's a substantial increase in revenue, mm -hmm. number one, and an impact. Um, but the other piece is, and I hear this often, hey, Pedro, since I'm doing this online coaching, it should be cheaper, right? Because it's not in person. It's not, it's not in my gym. It's not in my whatever the practice is. And, and I always go like, dude, aren't they still going to get the same results? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why would you charge less? Yeah, we don't charge less. Can you speak to that for a moment? Well, I mean, for us, actually, it's more expensive because we have shipping. That's included. true, instead of just handing them the food yeah, when they so get I there. Yeah, I actually think that it should be more. Um, it, it's funny because one of my team members, we ha we're actually global now yeah. because we have a client in Singapore. Look at you. <laughs> I know. And so they were asking me, you know, shouldn't the, the cost be different? And I was thinking they meant higher. And I was like, you know, maybe it should be higher or different. It should be higher. And they're like, no, we yeah, meant it should be less. And I'm like, why would I just don't understand? That's not of my mindset. Yeah. What do you think um, that mindset comes from? Um... It's a, a lack mindset. It's a poverty complex. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think it's a, a lack mindset. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. a good way to say it. Yeah, a poverty complex. Because mm -hmm. for some reason, the understanding is that if it's not personal, uh, therefore it's not valuable. But mm -hmm. there's a lot of things. For example, when I, I remember there was a time that I would go to a, a Charles Schwab um, brick and mortar place mm -hmm. and you know okay I want to buy get those stocks and here's some money and you know you got to get in your car and do that thing mm -hmm. uh, today you know whether I'm dropping another few hundred thousand dollars on cryptocurrency or whatever I just log into Coinbase and click 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 and it's done mm -hmm. the convenience factor as far as I'm concerned they can charge the same amount that Charles Schwab was charging me um, for the service fees because the convenience to me is worth it. Yeah. Like I'm not saying, hey, because I'm not dealing with the human. In fact, the humans take longer because sometimes you go, hey, how's your day? And they tell you a long, drawn out story. And now mm -hmm. I'm sitting there in front of you and I don't have time to sit there in front of you. And I'd rather just Coinbase or whatever the platform is do the thing for me. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it is a poverty mindset that will kind of get people to think that because it's online, it should be cheaper. Yeah. No, our services are exactly the same. Mm -hmm. The results are exactly the same, so we keep the cost Bingo. right where it is. And so, and so, okay. So to that point, um, if if you were to tell a up and coming, I always like to leave an up and coming entrepreneur with a piece of nugget because one thing we all tend to do when we draw out what our perfect business is going to be is we overestimate what we can do in a year and we underestimate how much we could achieve in five years. Mm -hmm. um, what was what would be that? You know, being where you are now, you've got five locations inside of six years. You've got PhD weight loss online now, and you guys are technically global, and um, we're really scaling your company. What's that piece of advice that you would tell a new entrepreneur on their path? Mm -hmm. I think that it's really easy to drop into a fear mindset and let fear just grab hold and paralyze you. Mm -hmm. And so I think being rational about where you're headed, but I don't know, it, this might sound cheesy, but just doing something that's daring, that's unreasonable, um, being courageous and getting out of your comfort zone and just trusting it, <laughs> you know, if you, if you have, if you can listen to your gut and if it seems like it might be a right move just to dare and be courageous and kind of shut that fear down. Mm. Dare, be courageous, and be willing to do something unreasonable. How often in life have we been told, instructed, and, and just maybe seen, modeled, that, you know, just be reasonable. Don't be reasonable, because don't, don't risk so much. Don't dare so much. And it's unfortunate because, and I know the people that say that around us have the best of intentions, whether it's mm -hmm. parents, grandparents, school teachers, the intentions are good, 
but the outcome puts us in a state of mediocrity where we feel this gnawing of greatness within, but we never really get to exercise it. And in our later years, we begin to feel a sense of regret, like mm -hmm. what could I have done? Mm -hmm. How much more could I have served? Because I do truly believe myself that the rent that we pay to be on this planet is the service to others. Um, and if you feel like a sense of regret, uh, I'm not, I haven't found my calling, I'm not doing my calling, I could be do more of my calling, you're really saying I'm not paying my share of my rent. Mm, I like that. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing all your knowledge and, and wisdom here with us, Ashley. Um, if, if people want to find you or uh, to be able to just follow you and learn mm -hmm. from you or to even, you know, work with PhD weight loss, where do they go? Yeah, our website is myphdweightloss.com. Mm -hmm. And we have Instagram, Facebook for PhD, just PhD weight loss. And then I have my own personal Instagram, thanks to you, Beatros. <laughs> and it's Dr. Dr. Underscore Ashley Lucas. Very well. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me. And guys and gals, thank you so much for watching and listening to this episode of The Empire Show, an inside look. And of course, you know what to do. Leave us a five-star review on iTunes. Uh, leave some comments. Take some screenshots. And when you share this in your stories, be sure to tag Dr. Ashley Lucas and myself. And as always, have a great day. And don't forget to tell your mama.